Good morning, if you are in the West Coast of the United States, um, and good afternoon if you're in the East Coast, or good evening if you are joining us from uh, Austria or from Turkey, as our presenters are. My name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, uh, whose infrastructure for Zoom we use and we are grateful for. Uh, today, I'm here to introduce to you a panel very briefly, uh, and then I'm gonna pass the baton to the chair of the panel in one second. So uh, here we go, we are together, all together here today uh, for the making of a mid 19th century Ottoman gazetteer. Um, this, you will see the gazetteer at the very end of the presentation, you will see it's kind of going to be like an almost online lounge. Uh, this piece of work is the result of a collaboration, a multinational collaboration with uh, resources coming from the European Union. Uh, two research projects are involved, uh, or Urban Occupations, OETR, and Pop Geo DG. Uh, the first one was led by Adam Kabadaye, and the second one by Grigor Boyko, who also participated in the first one. The first one was an ERC funded project, and the second one received funds from Mary Curie, uh, which is also European Union, but not ERC. Anyway, if you are not in Europe and dealing with bureaucracy, these are uh, fine details we don't need to worry about. I don't want to take more time than it is. Do you just want to introduce you to uh, Julia for a second? Julia Jambakal my colleague at Sabanji University. Uh, all of you know her from uh, her work. She doesn't need an introduction, but let me remind you of her wonderful book, Society and Politics in an Ottoman Town, that was about Ayn Tab. Uh, and then let me share with you just a few of her most recent articles. Uh, this, these articles, by the way, are sort of like drops from a very large research project that she was involved in and, and, and is, she is sort of releasing the outcomes of this amazing project uh, that uh, is based on probate records of deceased individuals from different parts of the Ottoman Empire over many, many centuries. So she is releasing us incredible data to work with. Uh, on the early modern period. I was most interested to read her slaveholding in the Ottoman central lands, 1460, 1880 myself, uh, as uh, I'm interested in, for instance, slavery of Africans. Um, book ownership across centuries would be of interest to anybody who wants to do cultural history. And I'm warning you, the data, the richness of the data, the aggrandizement of the data is going to blow your minds. And wealth and demography in Ottoman probate inventories are that based in very long term perspectives. And she does mean very long term. Julia Jambakal's recent research is going to give us so much to talk about in coming years. And I'm looking forward to her uh, upcoming uh, articles, the release of them. Julia, please go ahead. Baki, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by saying, I mean, I'm so, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, you can all hear me, right? Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here because uh, actually, uh, I'm speaking of, of one of the projects that uh, Baki has just mentioned, Erdem's project. Uh, I've been following it. I've known about it from the day of its inception, maybe a little earlier even. And uh, so I've seen it evolve out of its uh, original scope over the years into something even more exciting than it had originally been. And so, so it's great to be uh, moderating this panel. And uh, exciting, not obviously, I, I, they allow me to say just a few more words, exciting not only because of its methodological and uh, substantive uh, contribution to the field, but I wanted to mention one thing that often gets unnoticed in these uh, big projects. That is that yeah, it's been a school. I've seen it that it function, it served as a school, Adam's team I'm talking about. I'm sure Igor's team has already replicated it and exceeding it. Uh, 
that trained a school that trained a large uh, cohort of young scholars. And that's something to be really uh, recognized and uh, uh, congratulated. And I wanted to express it to, you know, uh, to Adam for doing that. Okay, without much uh, further ado, uh, allow me to uh, begin by introducing uh, Ardam Kabadayev. Uh, Ardam came to history from economics. His BA, his uh, master's degree were both in economics, uh, the latter from uh, University of Vienna, and he gained his PhD from uh, University of Munich in 2008. And uh, his early work, including his uh, dissertation, was mainly about uh, labor history of the late Ottoman Empire and its interaction with modern state making and, uh, and industrialization. And uh, he has worked on other aspects of economic history of the Ottoman Empire and uh, has expanded through this last uh, project that he has embarked upon, expanded his work uh, in the direction of digital and geospatial uh, humanities, uh, which we will hear about in a minute. And his geographical focus has been uh, Ottoman Empire, particularly the central lands, Bulgaria, uh, Greece and Turkey. And uh, moving on to Grigor Boyko. Uh, Grigor Bo uh, received his PhD in Ottoman history at Bilkent University in Ankara in 2013. And he's currently a, an assistant professor at University of Vienna. And uh, his, uh, or his, or his dissertation and early publications were on different aspects of urban history of upper grades and uh, ur urban geography, urban uh, archaeology. And now in his uh, more recent work, he's uh, merging uh, well-established uh, traditions of research, uh, of which people like me are more familiar with, uh, with uh, newly emerging tools of digital humanities. And especially he works on spatial and network analysis. He previously worked at, in two uh, ERC projects, one of which uh, Baki has already mentioned. And uh, currently he's working uh, on his own project funded by uh, the European uh, and uh, cultural research funds. Uh, the project is on the geography of, oh, sorry, population geography of Bulgaria from 1500 to 1920. The project is currently uh, hosted by uh, Koch University. And Akun Sefer, our last speaker today, is also a, a currently a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at uh, Koch University. He was a member of the Urban Occupations Project uh, before. He received his PhD from uh, Northeastern University in uh, 2018 and which was about uh, formation of the modern working class and class struggles and uh, again for uh, emergence of capitalism and state formation in the late Ottoman Empire. And uh, currently he's uh, leading his own research uh, project uh, as principal investigator on uh, shipbuilding and labor migration. Uh, from uh, between Black Sea region and Istanbul. Uh, I guess that does it. And floor is yours, uh, Adam. Julia, thank you very much for this uh, thorough uh, introduction. And thanks uh, for Baki for inviting us. Uh, to present um, our results uh, and also um, give you some insider information about running a large scale project project uh, like the one that we've conducted here. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, quick information about what we will what we've got on the menu. So, what we will present. So, uh, as the principal investigator of this project, which is about the end officially, it will end um, at the end of September. Uh, I'll give you a bit more of a technical um, presentation, uh, around 20 minutes, and I would like to share some 
kitchen information to you. So how we've collected the data and what we've been trying to do. So it will be kind of a more um, technical presentation about a large scale project. And I really want to share this with you because I think these are the right venues to share this information. Not only the data sets or the results, but the way you try to work with a large group. So what can you do? the turns you take or the turns you didn't want to take, but you had to take, et cetera. So these things, I'll give you a little bit of that uh, kind of information in the 20 minutes, but I'll also stick to the uh, technical part of the story uh, so that maybe you can have a better understanding of what we've been trying to do. Uh, and then um, Grigor will give uh, 10 minutes, uh, another presentation. It will be more about the collaborative aspects of these two projects. Not so much technical, he'd also mention, uh, of course, what he's been doing his own project. And then we will switch in the last talk by Akin, the details of the Ottoman Gazetteer that we are in fact trying to show you at the end of the project. And very lastly, I'll just show you and share with you with the Gazetteer. So this is a project on the Gazetteer, but we would like to really spend some time how we got there in the last five years. So this is what we presented, prepared for you. I hope it will be, enjoyable. Um, so let me then uh, start with my own presentation. I've got about 20 minutes, as I've said. Now, first of all, uh, some details. Um, it is a five-year project. It has been a five-year project, but due to the COVID interruptions, disruptions, we've got a, 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 an, an extension. So it will be a six-year project. Thank you very much for Julia's uh, kind words. We had in total more than 60 people engaged in this project. And in this peak time before the COVID hit, we had a team of 20 people working almost full time. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time with a lot of people. And I'm really glad that um, Akin uh, and Grigor uh, and Pete Gerritz, whose name has to be mentioned, has been here from the very early days of the project. And one of the aims that we pursue now is to follow this FAIR data principles. And I've already put it on the slide. I hope you can all see that. So the idea is to try to really share data sets, but not only the data sets, but information about the construction of these data sets. And Gazetteer is one of the projects that we would like to share with the community of Ottoman studies or even other people so that they can make um, use of these uh, data sets. And we may try to get back to that in the later stages of the presentation, as well as in the q &A. And the team was interdisciplinary. It became more interdisciplinary. In the first three years, the official uh, partner of the project was Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Structure. And its former director, Lee Shaw Taylor, was very helpful and influential in the way we built the early stages of this project. And it was, I think, very important for us that we've got that partnership. Uh, but in, after the end of the third year, we moved away from history a bit. And instead of really positioned in the corridor of economic history, or economic and social, but mainly economic history, moved a little bit toward geospatial humanities. And that also resulted in a shift in the partners. So we've just... Um, got a very uh, civilized divorce uh, from Cambridge. So we've just separated our ways. And then now official partner of the project is the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences from the University of Glasgow. And in the later stages, we've got colleagues working in fields such as geospatial data science, remote sensing, geography, geometrics. And this was a process that uh, I didn't plan in the beginning of this project, but it evolved towards spatial humanities. And Pete's name is mentioned, this is important. I shouldn't have, okay, good. That's, that's the important bit. Now, related to the research project, the real agenda or the way we I have uh, thought about this project is to work on regional economic development differences. And from 1850s, 1840s up until 2000. So that is the overarching research question or the research agenda. This has been the driving motivation for me to work uh, in long-term longitudinal data sets to, to go after this research agenda. This is what we've been pursuing. But it has created also four sets of research questions urbanization, industrialization, agrarian change, and transport, which are interconnected in any context. It doesn't have to be Ottoman or Turkish, but in order to be able to understand the industrialization or economic development, 
at least these four components should be taken into consideration in their interplay. And that is a necessity. And in order to be able to achieve these, achieve these goals, and they are interconnected, this is crucially important. And we've been working on this for six years. There are several aspects of this. And uh, for this presentation, I picked one example, which brings the research questions of urbanization, agrarian change, and transport together. And it is a sampling strategy. It is a little bit technical. I've studied, um, as you've heard in Munich with Sureya Faruqi, Grigor wrote his dissertation with Halil Inalcik. So we are coming from, in our PhDs, uh, from the Ottoman studies um, school of thought. But in this aspect, this is more of an economic history project. And sampling is something we I never have conducted uh, and before I've started to work on this project. So sampling can sound a little bit non-Ottoman studies um, confirmed. But uh, for our purposes, we needed this. And I'll show you why we needed it. And in order to sample Ottoman documents, we have created a gazetteer. So the gazetteer is, in fact, a byproduct which can be even more important than the real goal of sampling, but the way we created the gazetteer is the need to sample Ottoman Temetua tax registers from 1840s. Now I'll get into a bit more of detail of this and give examples about how to estimate agricultural mix, agricultural volume and area of cultivation with the sample for the mid 19th century. And these are important aspects if you are interested in economic history of the mid 19th century Ottoman Empire. And in order to be sampled, we also had to work on population geography, transport facilities, and also geography. There, I think in these, uh, in the geosampling exercise, all these factors are coming together. So let me focus now on the sampling. We were trying to get longitudinal data sets for chosen regions of the Ottoman Empire from 1840s until 2000. And this is, in fact, the way we asked the funding from the European Research Council. So the idea was to create data sets, extract data, and also longitudinal data sets to ask questions about agricultural transformation, industrialization, urbanization, and transport. The reason for this is that uh, if you go for the 20th century, we have census data. But if you want to use the mid 19th century micro level or the archival documentation, which has never been cataloged properly or tabulated or standardized, it's a difficult process. So the idea is to how do you bring individual based micro level economic demographic data extracted from the individual Ottoman documentation with later era census data. So that was the bottleneck of the, the project, high risk, high gain, they say it in the jargon of the ERC. That was the high risk, high gain bit. And in order to be able to do that, we first worked on the later period. So for example, we've just got the old Ilche, which is Kazan Ottoman or Sabdris of the Ottoman or Turkish Republic in 1927. So just try to visualize this polygons in the language of the GIS. So if you, in the census era, you have demographic economic data for these territories. 1927 is the first uh, Ottoman population census, sorry, Turkish Republic uh, population census. Also the cultural census is conducted very first time in the Turkish Republic. If you move to 1935, for example, and if you are interested in the agricultural production for every sub-district, you have total area of cultivation, total volume of production for 14 distinct products for these territories. And the idea is that how can we compare the dynamics of agricultural production for 1840s for selected regions? So that was the need to go for a sampling. And our initial attempt was, in fact, to try to think about regions. I mean, I really also want to thank Julia, because in the earlier and even later stages of this project, we had the opportunity to, to think together. And especially regarding the regional differences of the Ottoman economy, I mean, it's an obvious thing. Um, although it's one entity, the regional differences of this vast geography is immense. But sometimes people can overlook it and overlook it. And I really, you know, Julia knows this and we've discussing this uh, and it really was helpful. So the fact that the Ottoman economy is in fact a 
summation of regional economies is something that one shouldn't forget. And following this idea, initially we've thought to really focus on these selected regions. Ankara's yellow dots are the centers of these regions, which are the major cities of the mid 19th century Ottoman Empire. So this is Ankara, Bursa, Manisa. I'm going from east to west, as you can follow Edirne, Ruse, Plovdiv, Thessaloniki, Bitola, and then Vranje. So these were the regions that we wanted to work on. And the idea was to really get into the archives, get the Temetuat registers of, and our blue dots are also the towns surrounding that. So in the earlier stages, we've spent a lot of time and effort to read Temetuat registers from these cities and towns. The idea was to really have an idea about the regional differences. But then another obvious fact as a wall, I mean, I just hit that wall, and that was that Ottoman economy is an agricultural economy. So the representativeness of these cities and towns for these regions were very limited. Then the idea came that now we have to go to the countryside because the vast majority of the people are living on the countryside, vast majority of the agricultural production has been happening on the countryside. So the need was to go to the agricultural production on the countryside, not uh, surplus exchange locations such as towns and cities. But I do not want to pull you into those details, but this was the need for the sampling. And in order to be able to sampling, we this is our suggestion to sample, which means we've thought we should try to get the 5% of an Ottoman Sanjak and then is a population share in the sample. 5% is normally a very established sampling uh, volume, as you know. And then we thought we should bring in agricultural suitability with a heavy weight. These are land capability classes. I'm getting a bit technical here, but we will end up with the gazette here. Bear with me. I hope I will be able to express these technicalities. And then we've also used connectivity, the transport network of these locations. So the idea was, let me give you an example about let's say Saruhan, I've got some details there. There are about 500 populated places in the district Sanjak of Saruhan in 1840. The idea was to get a 5% sample of these 500 places and then read the entire data and have an idea about the dynamics of agricultural production in that region. So that was the sampling strategy. Then we did this. So it took some time. But uh, we've start, and Gregor will uh, mention details about that. We've start first in Plovdiv and also Ruse. So these were the first regions we've start with the sampling. Then we conducted the same sampling strategy for Ankara and then Bursa and then Manisa and then Edirne. So these are the six regions where we've sampled populated places, settlements, villages, which represents the geography and also the 5% of the population and the connectivity for a region. So the idea was to try to talk about the major dynamics such as agricultural mix, total area of cultivation, and maybe the volume of production for Ottoman districts. And in order to be able to do that, you have to geolocate and assign population to all of the top populated places in Asanja. So in order to be able to sample, Grigor and I, and he's been really influential in this, I sh should really say this because I was, it, it, it didn't sound right to do this in the beginning. So he convinced me that geolocating, you know, 400, I think 402, but 400 uh, places in Plovdiv and then try to conduct the settlements. And then when we've started, we've continued to do this and we've built up a team within our team, led by Akin, who's been conducting the geolocating populated places using Ottoman population registers for a large scale undertaking. So we've started to move slowly to a regional mid 19th century gazetteer. All the colorful dots there are in fact geolocated locations, geolocated populated places with total population numbers. But then, we've started to think about larger and we've thought that maybe we can uh, get into, uh, we can consolidate territory on this. So in this respect, uh, we've continued 
doing this exercise and brought also the transport in. So we digitized the historical transport infrastructure because that was necessary to, to conduct our sampling strategy, not only for the regions, but for a larger territory. That was the idea to really go a little bit bigger and cover territory. So then the idea was to then, okay, let's continue to geolocate. And these are the samples. I've already mentioned this. Very quick information about how this thing works. These are the total places we could locate in Saruhan in 1840s. Numbers, I'll just mention a little bit of them. 18 subdistricts, around 500 places, one major city, total population is there. You just made the maths. So if you really want to spend my time to read the entire Temetua registers of these places, we don't know even they are available in the archives, but that takes about more than three and a half years for one researcher. So the sampling need is there if you really want to talk more about the dynamics on a regional scale. So after that, the idea is that we've got these points geolocated, we bring in the transport infrastructure. Since they are located, we've got the agricultural suitability because of the ruggedness and also the elevation profiles of these locations. And then we've sampled them and we just try to read the five white dots to have an understanding about the kazas of this region. I will not get into details of that. Then we type into the data and we try to get an idea about the regional dynamics of a culturally based mid 19th century Ottoman economy using this sample. And we did this for Rusa and Plovdiv, as I've said. There is a publication from 2020. At the very bottom of all slides, you can see the URL of our project. You can take a look at the publication list if you like to, but we focused on agricultural mix changes pre and after independence Bulgarian lands with this using the sample. We did the same thing for Bursa and uh, sample of the Bursa Temetuat registers are also online available. So if you go to the web page, you will, can visit the public data sets, then you can download the Temetuas that we've read, coded and used for this publication. And lastly, when we were consolidating the territory, so this is the last stage where we stand now. In this effort, we've geolocated 16,306 places. And in the NFSA registers, Ottoman population registers, we've managed to enter in our data sets 18,502 places. Our geolocation ratio is about 91%. So around 90% of the places that we found in the population registers are geolocated. And the totality of these 18,500 settlements gives us a total population geography covering without Istanbul, this is very important, without Istanbul, around two and a half million males. So if you double that, so in the dots that you can see on this map, which are coded according to Liva structure, I'll talk about that at the very end of this presentations, we've got about 5 million people. So this is possible to conduct population density and other possibilities here. These are there. But um, now I'll pass the word uh, to um, Grigor so that he can give you a bit more information about what he has been doing in connection to this. And then we will give you a bit more information about the technicalities of the gazette. But this is the visualization of 16,306 places which we geolocated. Thank you. Yeah, Adam, can I ask you to stop the screen sharing? I thank you so much. I hope you see my screen and uh, it works just fine. Uh, I'll try to be very brief and uh, very specific, but I, I need to start with a correction. Uh, what Julia Hoja said just left the impression that my project is going on. Uh, actually, to me, this meeting is a is a sort of going travel back in time to 2019. I, I'll give you some details. That was a project that uh, started in 2019, and I had to stop in 2019. Uh, so it never ended. But uh, let me let me first. Uh, just drop a few words about 
the European funding schemes. I, I, I guess this is mostly an uh, US audience and, and this is something totally unfamiliar to probably most of the audience. Uh, what an ERC grant funding scheme is, is, is basically, uh, and what Adam got as a project, is the, the large scale funding. So you, you could go at different level depending on your uh, career stage, you could go between 1.5 up to 2.5 million euros. But the idea is that uh, you build a team with this research uh, funding and try to take really the, uh, the research at a different level. Uh, the other program that my project fitted in uh, is, is rather different. That is uh, also a very, very nice uh, funding scheme, but is uh, on the one hand more modest, it's up to two years, the funding is more modest, but most important difference I think is that this is basically a one-man army project. So it's, it's a single individual project and you, most of the time you, you run the research on your own, except for you know, some assistance training that you, you can get. Uh, what, what is also important to note in, uh, as, as a difference between these two projects is that the Marie Curie is intended uh, as, you know, it's designed as a mobility grant it, it, and it is intended to increase people's uh, mostly young postdocs, I don't fit in this category, uh, to increase their international employability. And this happened in my case in the sixth month of the project. So I had to drop the project and, and move to Vienna. But now let, let's go back in time and, and look at Erdem's project. Uh, uh, back in time, that, that should have been 2018, I worked for Adam's project. Adam approached me because he needed local Bulgarian expertise for working on his two regions in Bulgaria. And we did quite a bit together. I'll not uh, take you into the details of, of the work, uh, but he already mentioned the, the, the troubles with sampling strategy. Uh, we badly needed to find a way how to, how to deal with, uh, with the problem. And we even took a, uh, a trip to the region, which I highly recommend for every uh, research that really deals with provinces. So we traveled extensively in the region. I think we, we did about 2000 kilometers in, in, in two weeks or something visiting the places, uh, trying to make sense of the local geography. And back then, Erdem wanted for me to, to handpick three different types of settlements to be studied. Uh, settlements that uh, developed into uh, uh, into towns that were extremely successful from the Ottoman period to, to modernity, settlements that remained stagnated or remained about the same, and settlements that vanished. So we had to go and find what have vanished settlements. And, and this is, uh, in a way, crucially important, uh, yet with, with, the, with the thought of the gazetteer, because a, a what have settlements uh, I would say about 10% in the region disappeared. And if you would like to, to do a regional uh, study, that's, it's, it's, it's crucially important that you take those settlements that are not extant today also into, into consideration. So uh, I, I just wanted to, to share with you what, one of those uh, moments of revelation that we had during this, uh, this trip. That's, that's a moment when uh, we found uh, uh, one lost settlement. I tried to study, I studied this settlement in 2008. It's a rather a township that was created in the 15th century by a prominent Tatar family that moved to Rumili and existed throughout the Ottoman period, and then it disappeared. I tried to find it in the uh, in 2008 when I studied the uh, the place, couldn't find it. And then 2018, we returned with the. Uh, rather advanced technology, having the Russian military, 19th century military map geo-referenced on our cell phones and uh, virtually driving to, to the spot. And, and to me, this is a sort of also a, a comic self-reflection because what you see uh, on this picture is me looking at the phone and, and telling Erdem, this must be the place, but I don't see anything. We're at the point, we are exactly at the point. And Erdem looked at me and said, you know, if you remove your eyes from the screen, you see that you're actually stepping on pottery shirts. So that's that's actually how uh, uh, we discovered that place. And that place, uh, it's the name is Konush. 
it nowadays has the potential to turn into one of the most uh, important reference science the sites for Ottoman archaeology in Bulgaria, because I shared the site with archaeologist colleagues and they started studying already three seasons there. Now, uh, I think that that was the moment when we realized uh, we need to, to do way more uh, in order to be successful. Uh, and after a lot of discussions uh, came to the conclusion that basically all settlements should be, or to the best of our capabilities, all settlements should be identified and data should be attached. But that would, as you can imagine, that's a labor consuming thing. And uh, Erdem already had some funding, but that's not endless funding. So he had already an Anatolian team. We, we could have gone, we thought we could go for something more uh, uh, genuine as an idea uh, and try to uh, merge our interests and uh, really bridge two projects because Adam had an interest in the 19th century. I'm more pers I'm more interested in the earlier period uh, population dynamics, and we thought uh, if we try to uh, if we find a way to build synergy, uh, we could be successful in uh, at one hand attracting funding, but on the other hand being uh, useful to one another. So long story short, uh, I wanted to study uh, long-term population changes in Bulgaria, starting with the 15th century, ending up with the Doksanich uh, Harvey with the Russo-Turkish War in 1877-78, and then convinced me I should go even further in time. Uh, and I didn't want to do it because that was a lot of work. And then I just said, listen, I, in my project, I'm doing the censuses of Bulgaria. I can give you that data. Also, I can give you the road infrastructure that they have already uh, map mined for their project. So I can study the connectivity of the villages that I'm interested in. And also, Koch could be a really excellent research place that provides uh, facilities and infrastructure to, to conduct such a research. And yet again, I would like to mention Pete, whose GS skills were immense. And also everything I know about GS, I owe to, to Pete. Vice versa, if I am going for such a project, I could return data to Erdem's project that he doesn't need to do, like entire Bulgarian population data for the 19th century, and also all the settlements geolocated, and so on and so forth. As, as a byproduct of this endeavor is the so-called gazetteer of the 19th century, merging the data that I could create and Erdem's project could create. So, uh, Finally, that turned successful. Uh, project one, I got the funding. I went to Koch, started working. So there's a website there, uh, Koch University, still keeping alive. If if you're interested, you can take a look. There's some results, preliminary results of the project. Uh, but I, as I said, I had to cut it short uh, after the fifth month. But in one word, what was the idea of this project is basically to create uh, a really large geodatabase of Bulgarian population covering 1500 to 1920 and uh, try to study the, the dynamics of the population uh, fluctuations of, uh, of population, then try to look into population density variation uh, again with, with, with regard to uh, spatial temporal dimensions and circumstances uh, I also wanted to take a look into the to the household structure and uh, finally to to detect the human migrations within the country, uh, outside the country and also to the country within this uh, watch per, uh, period. And I'm very much convinced this is doable and uh, I'll continue this project sooner or later. I simply have other things to do right now in, in my plate. Uh, probably the 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 most important novelty of the project was an idea born in Erdem's office uh, is that uh, the traditional way of approaching uh, population densities, seeing them on, on, on a flat surface in two dimensional doesn't make a lot of sense because if you look at these two regions uh, uh, in Bulgaria that are high in the mountain, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to imagine that there'll be a lot of places that are simply human inhospitable 
And therefore, if you, if you take this watch territory and simply go for arithmetic density, dividing the, uh, the, the surface into population, you could conclude that these are sparsely populated territories. But if we find a, in, somehow an inhabitability index, uh, I don't want to go into that uh, and explain how we came to that conclusion. But if we find an inhabit, inhabit, oh, sorry, inhabitability index, the picture changes and turns them into very densely populated areas. And uh, all that, luckily, we put on paper. And this is forthcoming in, in a paper. At least the methodology and the, the main ideas uh, will appear uh, over there. So in five months, I did most of the country. For the 19th century, what you see missing in the gazetteer is in Bulgaria. It's my fault. I couldn't finish it. Uh, that will come uh, in the near future. So these are basically the different Kazas uh, and Nahias in Bulgaria with the points uh, indicating uh, individual villages and the data is attached to these points. So uh, let's return to the gazetteer. The, that, the contribution of, of Pop Geo project is uh, those populated places in Bulgaria that uh, with time were to be merged uh, with with the uh, Anatolian and European Turkey uh, gazetteer. And to end up on one note, uh, actually we did not try to reinvent the bicycle. The idea for gazetteer has been uh, talked about in two very important meetings that Amy Singer organized in, in, in Princeton and that uh, Erdem and I uh, attended and I see Natalie Rotman's also in the room, she was there uh, and the, General conclusion about, I think, in both of the meetings of, of the group uh, was that the, probably the most easily achievable in the near future instrument that we badly need for the Ottoman studies, that's a gazetteer. We badly need it so that we can work in whatever dimension you can imagine. But that requires a lot of local expertise, cannot be done by one person, cannot be even done by one single team. Just try to imagine Hungarian and Georgian realities together with Balkan and Anatolian realities. Uh, that is a uh, that is a process, and I hope with with uh, this small contribution we can we can really start something. And I pass the the word now to Akan. Thank you, Grigor. Uh... Hello, and uh, I'll also, I hope you can get my voice. Uh, so I'll also try to be very brief, uh, introducing our data entry process in the making of the gazetteer before Erdem uh, will be introducing it to you in more detail, giving an overview basically of uh, how we extracted data from the population registers and uh, the what kind of registers we used and how we put them into the GIS database and perhaps very briefly mention uh, some of the challenges of this process. So um, as Ardam uh, mentioned, we used the registers from the 1830s and the 1840s, which is known as the first modern Ottoman population census. But here we are not referring to a one-time all encompassing survey of the of the populations in each settlement or, or administrative unit. In most cases, throughout these two decades, these surveys were taken sometimes twice, sometimes three times or more, in addition to being updated each year. Uh, and the reason is that bureaucratic standards and guidelines uh, as to who should be covered and how they should be recorded were not established yet. Uh, so in many cases, the earliest surveys uh, in most settlements had to be repeated after uh, five or 10 years uh, in order to make up what or who were missing in the previous efforts. So in the archival records concerning these surveys, uh, what we have is not a single block of registers belonging to a specific year. Rather, uh, for each settlement, we have multiple registers from 
different years with varying qualities in terms of the, the preservation of the records as pages could be missing or torn or just decayed, uh, making us unable to use them. That's why in the Gazetteer, you'll see a register date column and uh, you'll see that the years of the, the registers we are using uh, uh, range from the early 1830s all the way uh, to the late 1840s. So, uh, so we are not using a, a single year. Uh, so let me tell a little bit about what these registers look like and how we picked the most uh, suitable register for our purposes. So based on our observations, uh, we believe we could roughly speaking, again, for at least for our own purposes, we could categorize these registers uh, into three different sets or series each of which might correspond to a phase of the survey process or a, a level of the evolving quality of the records, uh, at least content-wise. So uh, we have the earliest sets of registers from uh, the early 1830s, uh, a typical one, as you can see here, mostly missing household information and individual ID numbers. But again, there are exceptions like the registers uh, you see on the right, uh, uh, an example of which you see on the right, uh, where household differentiation is at least marked, if not numbered. Uh, but in most of the registers, we don't even uh, see that. So most of these surveys were repeated uh, uh, again in the late 1830s and early 1840s. Uh, and in this case, however, we have a clear information with regard to the household and individual numbers. Uh, so we have uh, a, a better information with regard to uh, calculating households uh, uh, and, and populations, at least the official figures in that case. So, and there's then a, a third series, a third major set of records mostly belonging to the mid to late 1840s, uh, where we see, as you can see, uh, household differentiation is much more clear. And most of these registers, unlike the earliest, earlier ones, uh, contain statements of testimony, if you like, by the local representatives of the village or neighborhood or sometimes the entire district regarding their reliability. So these statements sometimes, uh, in most cases actually, testify what was problematic in earlier surveys, especially with regard to the coverage of the entire population as how the earlier registers uh, missed mobile groups like non-residents or those labor migrants who worked elsewhere. Uh, in these earlier surveys. So obviously, of course, we would prefer to use these um, officially more reliable series from the mid to late 1840s, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't because not every settlement has registers from this set. Uh, for many of those which have, uh, these remain limited to those non-residents who were missing in early registers. So it did not cover the entire population. So we could use this latest set of registers for only a kind of a tiny fraction of the total number of our settlements, like around 10 to 15% of the total. Uh, the data we used for the overwhelming majority uh, came from earlier registers. Uh, in any case, however, our basic principle in choosing registers to use for our geolocation process uh, that I'll uh, talk in a, in a short while is that it should, to our knowledge at least, it should cover the entire male population, both Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, and it should contain individual IDs and household numbers. And of course, the register should be clean and, and complete, so available to use. And, but in some districts or, or sub-districts, we could not find a series that met all of these criteria. So which forced us basically to make choices, comparing different sets with each other for each location, making decisions sometimes case by case. Uh, so in short, uh, we need to underline for the Gazetteer especially that the registers we used 
were actually selected according to those decisions we made um, based on the quality of the population data they provided, uh, as, as well as their physical quality, of course. And that's why particularly you see the wide range of uh, dates we use for those entries. So regarding the place names, the toponyms, and actually most for most uh, of our other entries in the database, our basic principle was that we remain loyal to the register. So we did not want to correct or revise the way a toponym was written on the register, even when we know or strongly suspect that uh, it should be written otherwise. So an Ottoman toponym that you would see in the Gazetteer should be identical with the way they were recorded on that specific register. Uh, and uh, of course, since there were no orthographic standards at the time, uh, there could be inconsistencies across different registers of the same location, as uh, scribes uh, could spell the name of the place with some variations. This is especially the case for non-Turkish place names, Greek, Armenian, or, or Slavic. Uh, uh, this lack of standards also existed in their Latin uh, transcriptions in, in contemporary sources as well, even in the 20th century, actually, which made uh, finding their locations particularly difficult as uh, different sources could spell the location differently. Uh, also, of course, this created problems in, uh, in transcribing them for our database. We used, uh, by the way, modern Turkish orthography in the transcriptions. So, uh, speaking of the geolocation process, what we did was first to uh, extract the toponym of the settlement and then use this toponym to try to locate uh, it on the GIS platform. If the location's name, of course, has survived to the present day, this was a pretty straightforward process. But if it has not, uh, then we try to locate it with the help of cartographic sources uh, like uh, uh, Erkan Harbiye or, or Kipert or the Scheheres Karte, all of which actually, unfortunately, were prepared in late 19th, early 20th century. So, and even then these sources missed many village or sub-village settlements. And uh, furthermore, uh, of course, through the second literature, if you know the settlement's original location, was moved due to a, a catastrophe like earthquakes or floods, our job got more difficult. And uh, adding on it, of course, if the settlement or if its name was changed mostly due to a Turkification, uh, et cetera, then these added another uh, uh, layer of challenges in locating them. So for all these reasons, in addition to historical maps, basically, we also consulted with secondary sources, particularly the Index Anatolicus website, but also thesis dissertations and other scholarly work uh, made on that district. So, and, and after locating it, basically, uh, we just entered the data on the relevant tabs on our platform, both the register and as well as the population. For populations, we made specific organizations arrangements in our database to be able to reflect the, the, the differentiations in each uh, for each population unit. So I can give more details uh, about this process if uh, questions come up, but I can, I guess, stop here for now. Uh, before passing the word back to Erdem, I would also like to highlight on my part at least all of these uh, challenges, uh, of course, could be overcome only by a collective effort uh, by our friends in the project with whom we worked against the, uh, the other challenges brought by life. Uh, I have to uh, underline that actually uh, because uh, we, uh, we worked uh, against the pandemic. Most of this work was done during the pandemic, uh, of course, it hit us all. Uh, uh, it hit us all, all of us, uh, and and uh, like everybody, basically, we went through a lot in the process. So once again, uh, I would like to underline that the work you will see uh, actually was done thanks to the painstaking time and labor 
uh, by each of our friends and colleagues in the project over the years. Uh, I think I can stop here, um, Adam, the, the word is yours. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just wrap it up. The last slide was, we've just entered the total population per location, but thank you very much. Now, uh, I hope uh, you've survived until now. So let me uh, share with you the data that which will be available uh, in, a, in very short, in three minutes or something. Um, first, uh, let me share screen. And just to be complete, this is the slide uh, that I think uh, Akunez uh, didn't mention. So the last stage was then to enter the population. So that was that was it. But now let me go back to the gazetteer. So uh, on our web page, on the project web page, I think in two weeks uh, you will be able to download this file and take a look at it and find our mistakes. Uh, please do that. Uh, so we are really keen on uh, getting uh, feedback for this. Let me introduce you the data set. It's a very basic table. It's a, then it's an Excel table. So we I've got some filters here. So we have these 16,307 places. And then we've got their transliterations for all of them. So this is a filtered version of the total of, from our data sets. So in this column, in every location, you've got a transcription coming from the Ottoman population registers, and then they are coded. Okay, first, then we've got the Kaza information as mentioned in the Ottoman population registers. Again, this is complete. So for all of the locations, you've got the Kaza information. But then due to the reasons that Okay, as just mentioned, uh, the Sanjak belonging or the administrative division changes. And therefore we had to quote this according to, we had to fix that. And therefore we look for the statistical yearbook of 1848, which enlists all Kazas of the Ottoman Empire in 1848. And then we quoted this, these Kazas, according to their Liva belongings, according to 1848. So this is fixed in time. So this is, I mean, of course, there will be explanatory notes on the web page, but then we are talking about the data set. I would really like to share this with this group so that we can get instant feedback and find out some mistakes that we did, for example. And then we've got in column G, this toponym of Ottoman in Ottoman. So we've just typed that in Ottoman. There are about 1,000 locations for which we haven't yet entered the, entered the Ottoman. So Right now in our data set, we have 15,148 entries in Ottoman. And this will take some time for us to control, um, do the, the remaining 1,000. Therefore, we will not wait until we do this work. In about two weeks, we have to just clean the modern toponyms. As soon as we are done with it, the data will be available as the first version. And every location has got a unique populated place ID. That's the column A. And if the readership or Ottoman studies or the universe uh, has uh, some suggestions, we would be very keen to get it, to revise it, improve it. So the idea is that have a living document here, not only in geographical context and uh, comprehension, but also correcting mistakes. And there are mistakes, that's for sure. So this is the... Nufus registered codes that we use for those 16,000 places. And the year range, Akun has already mentioned that in Hijri from 1246 all the way up to 1265 is there as well. And then we've got the exact locations as much as we could. So latitude and longitudes, uh, which you can use in any uh, software to map things. And lastly, just a count. And on the, in the very last column, you've got this project code, source project, urban occupations, or uh, POPKEO. So in total, Grigor has managed to do about 4,000 places. And then we did about a bit more, about 12,000 locations. These are according to their uh, LIVA belonging. So that's the data set. And next step is to post it online. At most in two weeks, it should be there. And uh, then we would like to improve the Ottoman and then also enlarge the territory and also try to do different gazetteers coming from different sources 
because we did a very similar effort for 1935, 1955, 1970, and 1990 Turkey for around 15,000 locations. So the idea is to build gazetteers. So that will be this gazetteer section on our webpage, which will be hopefully populated with further gazetteers. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you all for these very interesting, exciting uh, presentations. And thank you for all the work again. Uh, the floor is open for uh, questions, comments. Uh, I don't see any hands right now but waiting for while waiting for questions Julia, hocam, ask, there, are. there are why can't i see them sorry. just a second sorry just a second daniel don't be that old-fashioned man click on it there are other okay. people before me but all right um... i'm sorry all right okay now i'll start with uh with Natalie, the first name I see here, Natalie Rothman, please. I was actually the last one, so I'll happily defer oh. to the <laughs> one who was there before me. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't follow the uh, order of the hands up, so uh, we might just as well start with you if you don't mind. I'm not very experienced in All right, moderating. no problem. <laughs> Thank you Go so ahead. much. Um, and thank you to the presenters. This is a tremendous amount of work and a huge service to the discipline. So this is hugely appreciated. I have two very meta questions. Um, the first one, and for all, all of the presenters in whichever order you'd like to, to respond. The, one, the first one is really about kind of the landscape of granting and your reflections on what one can learn from engaging in this massive um, project, given the, the funding landscape, particularly in Europe, I think, and these very, very large grants that um, require um, a very hierarchical structure of, of people involved in the project, but also um, timelines that I think, at least in my experience, don't always align with the timelines of research work and require you to show um, deliverables at very pre predictable intervals that again may not align with how with the uncertainties of, of research. So that's question number one. The second one, I'm I'm really taken by Gregor's comment that um, the types of sources that are available to us in the 19th century are very different from the kind of Tahrir Daftar and other sources that one might use uh, for the early modern period and all the challenges that. Um, come up in doing this kind of geolocating, georeferencing for earlier sources. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about it and how one would go about producing similar work for early modern placing. Thank you. Is it okay that I try to answer the first question, dear co-presenters? Um, Natalie, great to have you here, thanks. Um, so the ERC funding, is very easy to conduct a research with. So um, in the application process, there are milestones, deliveries, and that kind of difficulties are definitely there, but it depends how you design the project. And in my experience, it is one of the least bureaucratic complicated funding schemes that I've ever involved in. Because if you get the grant, then you've got the liberty. I think the people who designed this in funding schemes knew and know that you don't know what you'll be doing in five years. And so they are, I think, a little bit strict when picking the people to fund. And the you know, success rate is about 10%. Uh, not ridiculously low, but not that high either. But as soon as you get it, you got only one interim report. So you write a report two and a half years later, and it is not very much expected that you have to really, you know, follow the suggestions that you did. So, and then you write the final report and there is no other involvement throughout 60 months. And financially you can do whatever you want to as well. You can add items into your budget, take them out, etc. So in my experience, 
it is quite a liberal way of funding research. So high risk, high gain, difficult to get, not that uh, problematic to pursue, as that was my experience at least. I'll pass the word to Grigor. I think that's kind of a question he can answer. Yeah, Natal, thank you for this question. It's, I think it's an excellent question. And that is a difficulty that I myself encountered. So to make it a little bit more clear to the audience, we basically have um, documents coming from various periods that list vocations and some metadata, be population, taxation, whatever you're interested in. Now, the, the chief issue is to spatially reference this data that that's to say to know where the vocation is. To my experience, um, I did I did the following, and that was the strategy I intended to do in the project. If I'm to start the project now, I'll do exactly the same. I would start with the 19th century in order to get to the 16th century and not the other way around. And there is a particular reason for that. Uh, for the Balkans, especially I got work here than my colleagues working in Anatolia because Russians and Austrians were more interested in spying on the Balkans and produced better maps in the 19th century. So I got excellent 19th century maps, uh, one Russian map at resolution one to 126,000 and the Austrian uh, military map is in one to 200,000, doesn't matter, but they list the macro toponymy before the major change that occurred with the emergence of national states in the Balkans. And especially in Bulgaria, it's tragic. Uh, most of the Turkish uh, toponyms were obliterated. So that gives you the chance to map more or less precisely, I would say very, very high success rate, uh, everything you see in the 19th century. The problem though, when you take it to the earlier period is that um, first of all, toponymy change occurred during the Ottoman period as well. A, a settlement that was named whatever in the, in the 15th century could have changed two times the name because of population change or because of all sorts of reasons. And then you render it down to the 19th century with a different name. And that, that would be one way to compensate uh, uh, returning back in time. You will find out those, you'll be able to track those um, name changes that occurred in the Ottoman period. And also the greatest problem with the uh, earlier data, like 16th century, 15th century uh, data is that there will be still settlements that for one reason or another vanished in the Ottoman period that have nothing to do with Bulgarian government or Russo-Turkish war or whatever other human caused factors, settlements did vanish uh, over all historical periods everywhere. So these will be the most problematic ones because you'll not be able to find them on any map. If, they, if there is a village somewhere that disappeared in the 17th century, it's very unlikely you find it mapped on any map. And my solution to that is working in very close connection with the archeologists who have done field surveys, who have registered a settlement with Ottoman material. And if you know that your settlement must have been between these two villages, you more or less know when you map those things where around should be. So that's one way to, to compensate. And I, I would say, uh, if we get archeological data arranged, which is another problem, uh, because we have a lot of surveys, but never, never, never systematized, uh, we'll be able to, to track almost all uh, Ottoman settlements from the earlier period too. So I, I hope this answers the question and that was the, what you asked me. Ojem, you're still muted. Oh, sorry, meeting, <laughs> it's your turn. Baki was before me, go ahead Baki. Metin Ojem, siz buyurun. Please, you go ahead. I'll, I'll wait for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let me first thank you all for uh, this, uh, you know, having done similar work. I know how much work uh, it must have been. And this is a lot more than I, I personally ever uh, handled. So I, I see the need for the team and all that. I, I, uh, you know, in advance, uh, 
lots of gratitude to, to you guys for doing this. Um, I, I have a, a very quick question uh, and a, about hopefully the first one is quicker. The uh, data that you sh showed us uh, seems to have just the uh, locations. And I'm curious about the rest of the data, like you know the actual households and whatnot. Is there any timeline for their availability? That's my quick question, hopefully. And and maybe I'll go ahead and ask my other question, and you can answer both together. And uh, I heard different things about the sampling process. Uh, at some point, you mentioned five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent. There is that ratio, and also about the methodology involved in sampling. Uh, and, and even I heard terms like you chose registers, that doesn't seem like sampling to me. It's, it's, the minute you choose something, you're introducing bias uh, as opposed to sampling, which suggests some random sampling or some systematic sampling, clustering perhaps. Uh, and if you, are choosing, are you choosing based on what? Uh, if you could elaborate a little bit, this is a technical question, so I understand not everybody's interested in this. So, you know, very briefly, what kind of sampling did you guys use? Erdem, I think these both go to you. If I miss anything. Um, first, the population data, although I urged, and I shouldn't have done that, uh, to Akun to share the last slide. It was, I mean, Akun was giving you the background of the information that the idea behind the geolocation, geolocating places was to pin down the population. So we didn't want to conduct a, this whole thing to make a gazetteer. The idea was to really um, territorialize the population data, to have a random sample. So we choose the population registers that has got the largest coverage with the hope that we do have the universal coverage, which means in our territorialization, the idea was to get the entire toponyms right and entire locations right. So I can give you the Saruhan example. In Saruhan, I think we got 100% success. For our understanding, success means we go through the available population registers which cover the entire Sanjak with toponyms which we can read, with toponyms on the right pages, no missing things, because we also, I've missed a column in the explanation. You will be able to see it in the gazette here. We also made use of two types of population registers, Mufassal and Ijmal. So we, through the Ijmals, we got the total number of locations in most of the districts, and then we've shopped in the archives, in about 20 years time bracket from 1240s to until 60s to get all of the, if possible, all of the places. So this was what we've been choosing. We've been choosing the right population registers to geolocate and assign total population of the entirety of the Sanjak. And then it was the first step in the population, 5%, uh, we've then, we've, this is a geosampling, random geosampling, based on an analytical hierarchical process. And the percentages on my slide were the weights in the sampling system. So we weighted the population and transport and also a cultural suitability to reach the 100%. And then we randomly selected using the GAS sampling tools, 5% of not only the population, but also the populated places per kaza. So we had two constraints for the population. If you have 18 kazas with 500 places in them for Saruhan Sanjak, we've sampled for every kaza at least 5% of the populated places in them randomly. That was, so it is a random sample, but in order to be able to sample, you have to choose the registers to cover the entire population. You have to choose the historical maps to cover the transport for the entire location. And then we also got the agricultural suitability maps from soil scientists per these regions from one to eight regarding the land capability classes. So after you got all those ingredients, which you have to choose and pick, we can choose, and then, you sample randomly. So then we've just generate, we use the GIS 
sample generator under the constraints, the places which fits into five different suitability categories. And then we went into the archives, looked for the temetuas of those places. If we couldn't get, let's say five villages in a casa, then we resample randomly. And then I then went for the randomly chosen temetua registers of the rural populated places in the archives. This is the entire process. Now I'll be very happy to hear your feedback. We've already written this in some pieces and in two pieces, it's already, it's there in written form. I would be very happy to get your feedback on that. So that's the structure of sampling. Um, population data, not yet. So for several reasons, because I mean, we want to do the gazetteers first, get the population places right, because I, we've already written a co-authored work. This is Akin, me and Grigor submitted into uh, Ottoman journal. I hope it will be accepted Then maybe we can read. So we've already tried to map the Ottoman population densities per Sanjak based on this data. There we've got not only 16,000 uh, places, but we've got 18,500 locations. Because although we cannot exactly geolocate around 2,000 places, we know that in which Kaza they are. So through these dots that you've seen, we can create or estimate the polygons of the Kazas and the Sanjaks. Then we can assign the total populations to those territories. We've already, I mean, we just submitted the first version. We've just calculated the population densities on Sanjak level for uh, the territory that you just saw. So we are still working on this. As soon as we think we can really trust on our gazetteer with the population data, then we will make it public. Mitin, any further questions on this to pursue? Uh, no, another question, but let me say one uh, quick uh, thing. I, I think that there was one question Natalie asked and that I think I'm going to answer this a little bit too. Uh, at the Kazal level, not so much village, but at the Kazal level, one source, I don't know if you guys used, that gives uh, good information in terms of names. <laughs> all variations and uh, all non-variations, all historical names are included in this geo names uh, data set that I found to be very useful. And uh, Natalie asked about earlier, uh, uh, periods for a similar source that I'm sure everybody knows here is the 1530, uh, not exactly census, but the title registers that covered just about the whole empire. And we were able to geocode that every, every Kaza, well, I shouldn't say every one of them. We have about 470 of them all georeferenced. Uh, and for that, we use geo names. Uh, and that, but then again, that doesn't give all the villages. It's not at the village level. So uh, I don't know if that, that answers Nelly's question, but this, uh, for, for, I, I can do the similar kind of thing for uh, 1530. Okay, thank you. Uh, before turning to you, Baki, there's a question that I missed in the chat box uh, by Carl Grossner. And this is a technical question, but. Uh, uh, here uh, he says, I'm working on a World Historical Gazetteer and wonder who is the best contact to see if we can arrange this data to get indexed in our system one day. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. let me jump in and just say a word. <clears throat> I just, I would, I would love to make people in this group aware of World Historical Gazetteer if you aren't already. It's uh, been in progress for five, <clears throat> almost six years now. And really it's a venue for publishing historical gazetteer data and for linking gazetteer data sets of any size with each other. So for example, there was mention of early modern Ottoman, uh, Anatolian data coming along in a data set and uh, the linking of a data set such as that with this one of the places uh, would be very interesting. And 
I'll just say that the, the one of the principal purposes of World Historical Gazetteer is that the incredible work that's been done to develop this gazetteer, for example, what it, which has been described as uh, uh, oh, difficult and time consuming and so on, it, it would be wonderful if it's published in such a fashion that nobody who's dealing with similar sources has to do that again. So that if, when people are trying to geolocate, geolocate, particularly the difficult places, that they can find those places in this growing graph of Anatolian uh, historical places. So, so I had asked and, and uh, that question, and uh, I did get an answer in private chat. So I'll be in contact with the people in this project about this particular data set. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to intrude further on this uh, very interesting conversation. Thank you all. Finally, back to you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Erdem, uh, Akın, uh, Durigor, you and your collaborators did an amazing job. Uh, and we, I mean, it, it's a really mind boggling to see that you could put all these hours to put produce this amazing map. And then I imagine soon, once you get the articles published and stuff, you will populate the map with more data the information about population, agricultural things, et cetera, et cetera. So it, they're not going to be available in the first release, but in future years, they'll be added. And so people will be able to go and click and see not only the place, but also the population in 18, let's say 40 versus the population in 1927. And then uh, the agricultural productivity at that time and this time, et cetera. It, it, so that, that will allow us to make a lot of comparisons. And I know that this is not yet available, but I, I'm just curious, is it possible to give us a little bit of anecdotal information on the kinds of things that you found, or do you want to keep them for the articles, not mention anything at, yet? So, so for instance, I expect for a big change in demographic makeup in terms of ethnicity, diversity, in these areas as a result of uh, First World War, uh, as a result of ethnic queens and genocides, et cetera, all of that. I imagine that will be, that would become visible. I had a technical question, the transport networks you, that you use, did you use these 19th century German or Russian maps to kind of connect the places together and get a sense of their connectivity? Or did Ottomans have map-like things in the in, in 1840s, in 1830s, where you could actually carry the road from this village to that town center and then take it to uh, the geo map. Because on the screen, you shared a lot of roads. And I'm thinking, you know, I work on 16th, 17th century. There is nothing like that. So how do you build the road on the map of the 19th century? Um, and then in terms of Again, if you're willing to tell us a bit about like a, not maybe spoiler alert, but uh, you mentioned the very big question at them at the beginning was to see change over long term, uh, sort of inequality between regions, etc. Uh, does it does all of this should suggest, for instance, the Republican push for agricultural something? Do you see, uh, do you see like that reflected in the results? Do we see all of a sudden a splash of agricultural production in the Republican period? Uh, do we have more productivity or things like that? Maybe you can just briefly mention it without giving too much of a spoiler. Go ahead. Wonderful questions. Uh, um, first, we've been lucky that not um, okay. Now, if you got an ERC grant today. Uh, or in fact, after 2017, you have to publish the data that you acquired within the project with a certain time limit. That was introduced after I got the grant. So officially, we do not need to make the data sets public. 
If you get a grant now, you have to. It's a commitment. We don't have to, but we will. First of all, I just want to mention this. And uh, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, now, coming back to the data sharing and other uh, possibilities. So we really have to do the data cleaning. One of the reasons that we do not publish the population data right now is the fact that you know the best test of pudding is in its eating. And in our case, it's to publish. Because Akin knows this story as good as I do. You can control other people's controls. But if you do this on the Excel sheet, I mean, Julia can also sing a song, I guess, here about data cleaning. So in a large data set, I mean, if it's not, I mean, I've written my dissertation on FS factories, wage ledgers. You can control that. There are 475 males, you know, but if you reach a level where you, you know, where you are thinking about two and a half million males, that if you double by two, let's say about 5 million Ottomans except Istanbul in a territory like that, the best way of checking the quality of the data to publish something. Don't get me wrong, it's not because to publish, not perish. No, you have to go engage yourself deeper with the data. PhD dissertation, for example, Efe Erunal has cleaned a lot of data, who is here, here, my PhD student, because he's using this data for his dissertation on the Sanjoko Hudavi and Digar, with uh, probate registers, population registers, and tombstones. Then the data is clean. Then we can make the Ottoman sample from Huda Bendigar publicly available because that's okay. So this is the stuff, to be honest with you, because I we have so much that we shouldn't be stingy about not sharing it. It is you have to be correct. I mean, there should be something wrong with you if you want to sit on this data, because I will not leave that long. There is no way that to do something like let's do something, publish and then share. That is not the reason, to be honest with you. First of all, that. Um, then discuss it here or clicking on the populations. I mean, I'm engaging myself a little bit Bulgarian history and the historical sources for Bulgaria. For example, in Bulgaria, there is Bulgarian National Statistical Institute give you the exact location and the total population of all populated places. It's about 5,000 from 1934 until 2011. So their National Statistical Institute did their job well. In our case, we don't have it, not even in 2020 for 2020. So therefore, in our case, we will be gladly open this up when we clean the data and there will be cross sections. 1840 is the first thing. Then we've already did this for 1935, 55, 70. We will, we will, that's okay. You know, that data should be out there. We can't work on it as a small group. I mean, the job will start after the data is publicly available so that our hypothesis can be tested, people can conduct studies. We are far, unfortunately, in our discipline, we are a little bit far away from what's going on in different disciplines. So I just want to say this. Coming to the answering to questions, some results. Grigor and I, uh, he already mentioned this, you know, forthcoming um, accepted publication work on, we just did something, a comparison between 1840 population registers with the um, uh, Bulgarian censuses up until 1926, Grigor, am I right, in that study, for Rusia and Plovdiv. And we've got the ethnicity as well, of course. And as you just uh, modestly noticed, uh, if you do ethno-religious composition of population data from 1840, this is before what has happened in 18, you know, before the implosion. So it is a very rich material. So we've got a controversial finding, for example, for Plovdiv, and we say that the Muslim population share after the independence is not that low. So this whole exodus, you know, McCarthy and for example, 1890. So you can test those hypotheses because if we done that our homework well, now we've got a coverage of the ethno-religious composition of a very large territory in 1840s. And the census making procedures coming in later centuries, although they are political, will give you another picture. And now we can really compare those things because we just lack the data to reach conclusions about the ethno-religious compositional change. We know that that change has happened, but the magnitude of the change is a guess if you don't have the data from 1840s. And therefore we are, I think, this is interesting material for that respect. 
from every place, we've already mapped the Muslim, non-Muslim, and ethno-religious composition of the entire Ottoman population, just to look at us. I mean, just to look for now for us. Then we have to dig a little bit deeper. We can get the ethno-religious composition per Kaza or even per location now for those 16,000 places. And that's an interesting data. It will be there. So we are not trying, it won't that take long. It will not take us that long to share it. That's that. If I, if it's okay, I'll just answer two other questions briefly as well. These are important questions. Transport. The earliest map, which calls itself a map, for our purposes is from Huber, from 1899, which maps for the very first time the sub-district borders, Kazas. And there are some map making in that period. Erkan Harbiye is a later version of that. We've got Kipert. Uh, in those maps, you've got the roads as lines. We've georeferenced them. I mean, we've georeferenced the Huber map, spent a lot of time just to be, you know, map it. But these are, in fact, connectivities. So the lines connecting places are not roads on those maps. They are, in fact, they are, in fact, a timetable or itinerary. You get an hour time distance between point A and B, and then you've got a line. If you're not, if you, you know, if you don't look closely, you can think that that's a road. If you georeference it, you see that that road goes through a mountain, which cannot happen. In that regard, this is a connecting places with time distance information. It is not a map. So if you want to use Hüterot's habilitation schrift from 1923, you can take a look at those maps, but these are itineraries. So the real proper map, which takes into consideration of the geographical look, and physical and geographical situation on the ground is the General Karte, the third military mapping of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. We've used that map for the Eastern European bit. It comes up until Bursa. And that, that's a map, which means you've got 14 different types of roads, footpaths, bridle paths. This, that's the map. Anything earlier than that is not a map. For the Anatolian side, Unfortunately, we couldn't find a matching map before 1942. So our map is the Deutsche Herreskarte, 1942 edition. And that we've gone through the making of that map. You've got the Ottoman sources in it. You've got the war office from Great Britain in it. And we had to opt that, that late map for the rural connectivity. And that's the big point as well. But Sorry for getting it in the details, but I'll finish this in a minute. But we do not measure the distances by meter with that map. We bring in the connectivity using a very late map for the Anatolia by having a dummy effect, which means whether there was a road 500 meters away from the city center or the village center. So we didn't rank places according to the exact meter, like 352, but whether that village had a road in 1942 in 500 meters distance from the village center. This is an approximation. We've thought that there will be continuities which we can do this, or you know, we assume Danube is a main road or something. This is the road structure problem. Very briefly, last thing, Republican push. If you think about the industrialization, we see these major things. I mean, we've also gone through the occupations in locations. You see the industrialization in urban locations. If you take a look from the sample and also the cities. So you interestingly, if you compare the occupational composition in according to the se sectors, which is you know occupational structure, primary, secondary, tertiary sectors, in several locations, you see a deindustrialization level. So the occupational structure from 1930s compared to 1840s, for, we did this for 16 locations. We also published this with Murat Uvench, in fact. So you, you see in some places in the, at the cores, in the urban centers, a loss of share of occupations within the industrial sector. One thing is that to be mentioned. And regarding the agriculture, we did this for Ankara and Bursa. Agricultural productivity doesn't increase between 1840 and 1940 based on our estimates. So you, see you have a very slight increase or decrease, almost the same level. Acre, if you made the calculation, a cultural productivity of land, total tons per acre, hectares, almost the same. Sorry for taking so much time, but they were wonderful questions. I just couldn't help it. 
That that is very surprising. The last two things you said, just I had my mouth open, jaw open. Wow, that's very interesting. So once you put this all out there, and also the other example you gave about how certain certain assumptions we have don't quite hold when you actually have the data to look at. That that is amazing. I it's 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 incredible uh, it's incredible mashallah mashallah allah nazardan saklasın i hope you can finish it bring it all to a conclusion in due time thank you so much for this great work so we'll we'll need to wrap up i guess right we're already past uh, one and a half hours daniel's hand was up at some point but i guess he uh, changed his mind right it's okay weeks ago erdem had told me daniel tell me when we can talk and I haven't responded to the email i'll do that and uh, i'll talk to you erdem about my questions after to tom okay same here i also have a lot of questions but uh that those will have to wait uh, shall we wrap up uh back your job um it, well, you, usually we do it with one hour and a half. That is true. We are over our time, but I would feel very bad if Daniel didn't get to ask. Is a graduate student. I, I would feel very bad to uh, 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 close it before he has a chance. Please, Daniel, go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the reasons, too, why I thought this is okay, I'll do it later, is because there are many things that I can ask about, but but I'll, I'll ask one. I have a methodological question for anyone who wants to take it, but not about the methodology of doing the research, but actually, but rather publishing the research. Um, uh, as you know, I've done some quantitative work, but my work is more qualitative, and even when I've done quantitative work, I've worked with only a few parameters, one or two data sets uh, at a time. Um, with 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 a project like yours with quantitative projects that are as complex as yours i wonder if you could tell us a bit about like citing um citing your sources kind of thing um is this always the sort of scholarship where you know we have it with narrative history as well some historians cite every piece of information that they that they state and others don't they say i'm telling you this paragraph is from this book and that's enough um if you could just share with us how that works um, I would be thankful. Can I go and then you First can speak? Or Grigor, I mean, I, I, I may be the last because if it's okay, I want to say something, but maybe you guys should go first. Yeah, in, in my research um, with working with watch population data sets, I would think it's virtually impossible to refer to every single source. And especially when you aggregate data and work with different spatial resolution, uh, you aggregate a lot of different sources. And if that goes uh, in a large time span, you virtually cannot really refer to every single source. Basically what I do is attach a list of sources at the end of the, at the, end of the study. And basically this type of work is very suitable for all sorts of propaganda, as it has already been mentioned. So basically, you, the reader faces the situation that you either trust the author and you trust that this information is genuine or you rather not, and then you go to the primary sources, do the work yourself. I can you mute it? Uh uh, yeah, uh, I mean, maybe Adam and Grigor uh, are like better suited to, to answer this question because I, I kind of uh, consider myself as a narrative historian still, although uh, uh, having worked with big data sets still, uh, I believe uh, uh, I'm more tempted to do narrative history. So, uh, but uh, yes, I mean, it's it's kind of very difficult to cite, especially when you know that the work is is collective and and that it's it's kind of uh like it it kind of depends on like the way you cite it you do the way uh you prefer to cite it of course i mean uh but the the, the project uh by definition every project is is a collective project and and people know this more or less so uh so that's why uh you cannot cite every single uh, thing that is uh, that uh, 
comes out of the uh, project basically. But uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, it's, it's up to your preference basically. So Daniel, thanks for this. And in fact, uh, before we start this project, Daniel and I had the chance to run a project George is also here. Glad to see you, George. Uh, uh, and he was also involved, kind of it. So we we've doing this uh, with Daniel. Uh, you can see that uh, probably in several web pages. Um, from we can even post some results. Daniel, if it's all right for you, could you share in the chat the Hashmadian web page? Maybe people can be interested in that part of our project as well. Now, coming back to the um, question. So, if I understood you correctly, if you are also interested in citing the sources of the data or uh, making it available for future research i think uh, that was that was Akun, the way that Akun has answered was the question uh yeah from what i understood grigor and Akun answered it two different ways which was fine but my interest was in was in grigor's approach how can me as someone using your research know yeah, yeah. yeah. okay then so in this case i mean specifically for the gazetteer it depends i do not want to be I mean, this is a big project and the, the things which are in the pipelines are going different places. So we are, we've just published something on bringing 2020 satellite image with the cadaster maps from 1854, two villages in Bursa with uh, 1950s air photos in between. So it depends what you do. So if for that project, you got the reference, you know, this is my aerial photo and, um, if you got a 20, 2020 satellite image from Mascar, you know, if you, we are talking about the NASA, then it is that. But if you focus on uh, Maxar, sorry, Maxar is the company. We've got the images from Maxar for that publication. But for the specific needs for the Gazetteer, for example, this is the reason why we deliberately picked those columns. I can correct me if I'm wrong. The entire data set has got, I think, 70 columns or something. So we've got columns. We've got the data that we've created through geolocating. You know, you've got the degrees to the sunlight, you've got the elevation, you've got several environmental variables. And we've got in total, I think about, I can again help me, 15 ethno-religious categories, something like that. Interestingly, we've got even Bulgarian as an ethno-religious category in 1840 Ottoman population register. Who would have thought that? The Bulgarian in the team didn't. So he was also surprised to see Bulgarian as an ethno-religious category in one population register. So if you want to go through these, then you have to give the exact code of the population register where you see Bulgarian or Publican or, I mean, there were ethnicities that I was not aware of. Uh, in those registers. But for the gazetteer, what we share with you is that, hello, this is the register code. This is the date of it. We have the page numbers we don't share with you, but because it can be misleading. So we say that in this register, there is a place belonging to Kaza X with the name of Y. And we've translated this in this way. If you want, you can also try to read that in Ottoman, we also provide the service to you in Arabic script. And we think this is in this location. If you want to take a look at it, go to the register, check that location. You can check whether we misspelled, whether you can check whether we mislocated. That's the information we share. And then what we also give as a reference is that according to the Ottoman 1848 dated administrative division, that location, should be in this liva. And next update, we'll be also providing that correspondence on the Kaza level. I think in a couple of months, we will also have that. And if you want to check that, you've got the NFSA 3036 as a register. That's the reference giving. Sorry, maybe I misunderstood, but that was, I think that's, this is the way we reference our work to the sources that we use. Well, thank you all. And actually one last brief remark about Daniel's question. I think as I understand it, he's referring to a problem, a question that will be facing more and more frequently in the years to come because of this expansion of big data. And uh, the more we are into it, the more the issue of authenticity, authenticating and uh, you know, 
referencing will become a problem. And that's why journals are you know, now changing their policy of data availability uh, and reproducibility uh, for uh, just as you know, ERC has changed uh, its own policy. So it's, it's a big, big, big issue. I mean, if, can I, if I may quickly just add, is an, sorry. Pardon me, who was sorry, that, Mitin? I just wanted to say as an economist very quickly, uh, this is a very common problem in economics as a very quantitative discipline. And the way people get around it is usually, it's a problem because you don't know how to cite your historical work that has thousand sources, right? You don't want to cite every single one of them it takes up too much space. More important, you don't know how other people are, should cite your data if, if you make the data exactly. available just like they're planning. So what the people do is they write a paper that gives all the sources, everything, uh, and describes the data. Find, hopefully you'll find a place that will publish that. Uh, and then you put that on your website where you, you share the data. You say, if you, when you share your data, please cite this paper. Uh, if there is no place to publish it, you can always publish it online as a, a you know, just a working paper or something just so you get the credit for the uh, citing of the data. Yeah, what, what I wanted just to briefly say that I believe in the near future, every standard uh, work published by a reputable journal that is based on some sort of quantitative analysis would require that the database, the data set used in this publication is attached to the article and the journal will take care of the repositories and, and find the sort it out. That's I, I think that's the only reasonable way how we can cope with that. Yep, new challenges. If I may. Well, I yes, know please. very quickly. So uh, Metin Ojan has just given this example from economics. And if you were quanted, it'll be like Julia just, just said. So we have a GitHub page for the shared data. And there are also Senado is a place to share the data. Or we've got a web page and there we've got public data sets. Uh, I think more important than where you make it public, the way you make it public is important. So therefore, in my first two slides, we've got this fair data principles. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So if you just put your data like we did, but without the exact number. So we made use of, I think, 700 temetot registers for a study. So in order to make it find, if you put somewhere, it's findable and accessible. But if it is, if you don't give the exact pages, the way you get the data, if you don't share the steps that you extract that information, it's information retrieval at that, either from a map or from a text, then it is not interoperable. So people cannot make use of that data. In our case, we did our best to share this data according to the fair, discipline, the fair principles. For example, for the Bursa case, we've coded the all of Usher, except the beehives, if you're interested in take a look, and also the total area of cultivation using the Korean land cover from European Space Agency. So there you've got the code correspondence. If I give you that, all right, 20% of the acres were conducted for use for dry agriculture, in our data set, you can see that it is Nohut and Bakla and Hunta and Shair. If you don't see that connection, it's not interoperable because otherwise you cannot record the data and do another exercises. So I think we've got a long way to go in history in general and also in other studies in particular to share data or what we understand from data. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. And uh, by the way, since we are way uh, uh, out of time, <laughs> past the time, I, uh, you must have noticed that uh, Daniel has just shared their uh, earlier project uh, with, uh, with Erdan. And uh, I'll give you a quick peek uh, if you haven't already. Uh, where is it? Here it is. That too was a was a very interesting project. Uh, uh, 
which it is also shares not, data. Yeah. And the whole uh, site itself, actually, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, is an excellent collection of uh, you know all kinds of material, per digital material pertaining to Armenian uh, Armenian past. Well, on this note, uh, shall we uh, say uh, good evening and good rest of the day, good rest of the morning to uh, our friends, colleagues uh, from yeah. all over Eurasia and America. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, uh, Ardam Akun Grigor. Uh, we look forward to the to what's coming next thank you thank you so much for everyone Julia. thank you so much and thank, Adam, you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you so so much thank you for the audience and please if you know of other projects that are on their way uh, i i you know i don't know everybody in the world i don't follow i as much as i do i try to but i might be missing please email me i especially would like to bring collaborative projects to whatsapp and i have done this uh, with other projects funded by European Union so far, but I, there might be others missing. Please always email me. Let me know what you're doing. And if you're involved in a collaborative project, I would really like to highlight it in a WhatsApp meeting in the future. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye.